Hello everybody, how's everyone doing today? I know it's been a long conference and we've had a lot of information fed into us over the last couple of days. So I, I wanna end on, a, on a, lighter, a lighter note, but one that I think is important, even though it's a lighter note, I'm not, we're not gonna dive too deep into technology today. We're gonna talk about the history of our industry, history of application security. The point, and, and by the way, this is extremely unabridged history of application security. Uh, anyone is welcome to correct me or yell out anything you think I'm missing as I go through a couple topics in application security. I love audience participation. I know there's a lot of people in this room who've been a part of this industry for some of you over 20 years. So please feel free to correct these dates. This is extremely unabridged. But the point I'm trying to make as we end AppSec California is that things are getting a lot better. You know, a lot of us are in the trenches solving difficult problems that we don't always succeed at. We have to deal with failure and insecurity and insecure code and the challenges of process and people and technology and getting it all to work. And it's, it's mentally exhausting. But what I want to show you here in this presentation as we zoom out and look at application security over the last like 20, 30, and even 40 years, things are getting a lot better. And we should be proud of the work we've done as an industry. Well, let's get to it. My name is, my name is Jim Manico. I'm going to be a presenter. I'm redacting a few things here. So uh, I did some things. But you know what's, what should matter is that what we talk about is useful to you in some way. He can hit me up on Manicode if you want to find me. Let's start with ancient history of, of some of the beginnings of application security. One of the first reports, modern reports on information security, comes from a, a DARPA grant where we, where we see the first RAND report task force for information security built in 1967. They released the, the report R609 to Department of Defense. To, uh, it's classified, it was declassified a few years later. This is the first major study, major comprehensive report on this thing, information security, that's affected so many of our lives. And here's what this report said. It's a very important message. Yeah, yeah. Bleep is messed up, right? And that's why I, I think this is meaningful is because that's the same, message, uh, the same message I hear from lots of you in the industry as well. From all areas, those of you who are building products, those of you who are consultants, those of you who are developers, we, we deal with so much stress and so much, I, I, you know, what would appear insecurity that it weighs on us. But look at this. 1939, we have the bomb. What's the bomb? World War II, Turing, trying to crack Enigma. And they're building the first generation testing tool to crack cryptography. And this is, these are physical devices. This is hammer and nail like building security tools. Who, the, who writes software for the security industry? Who writes security testing software in the room? Anybody? Raise your hand. Yeah, a few of you do. You're writing software. How would you like to get out like, like hammer, nail, and order wood to like do security testing? That's where we started. And to save people's lives, it changed the world that we were able to pull this off. But things have gotten a little bit better since that time. Let's, go, let's jump ahead a few decades. Now we're in like 95. The security administration tool for analyzing networks first comes out. Everybody gets their hands on this. And it's the first modern security testing tool that has a radical impact across the entire industry. This is something everyone gets to use. It's, 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 it's illustrating insecurity, one of the most common platforms of the day. And it's, and it's built in a pretty mature way compared to what was available at the time. So, and by the way, SQL injection, this has had a big impact in all of our lives. This has only been around for 20 years when Jeff Forrestal talked about this at a Unix meetup and, began, and talked about the first article and the first discoveries of SQL injection in our industry. That was only 20 years ago. As a side note, when did the fix show up? Does anybody know when query parameterization began to show up in languages? I had trouble finding this when looking through history. I'm guessing like around 2003. Anybody have a thought here? Anyone? No thoughts here. So I think about 2003, languages began to integrate. Uh, anywhere from 2000 to 2003, languages began to provide query parameterization. Th the point is, this is not that long ago that these core defenses to build secure software really showed up. What else? And 
uh, 2001, we have WebGoat. This is one of the premier products at OWASP. And it, it, it started, uh, Bruce began writing WebGoat the same year o OWASP started back in 2001. This is the same year that Mark Curfee started the organization, registered the first domain. A lot of people debate who started OWASP. Look, the, 2001, Mark Curfee with a few other people registered the domain and began the organization for the first time. And, this is the same year WebGoat came out. Why was WebGoat such a big deal? Who, you know what WebGoat is? WebGoat is a, it's a, seat, it's a capture the flag uh, application where you can test, you can hack it without going to jail. It's just a product that you can use to learn about application security from the testing point of view. Who here is a security tester? Or who here was a security tester at any point in their career? How many of you learned the trade on WebGoat at some point in your career? So there's most of us in the room who are testers. The point is WebGoat taught an entire generation of application security professionals how to do web security testing. And that, that birthed the whole testing uh, uh, industry where by 2002, 2003, Web, web security testing is mainstream now. Most corporations are beginning to look in this in some way. And again, a lot of us who, who were in that industry, who did that early testing, we learned it from WebGo. Because again, it's a way, to, way for us to hone our skills with, without going to jail. That's always a good thing, right? And so 2006, we see the OWASP testing guide come out. Around this era now, we're beginning to fine tune the skills in testing. We're now looking at efficiency. How many apps can we test per week or per month? You know, how can we scale up large teams of testers? And now there's just not enough testers out there that most every firm in this era is hungry to hire security testers. Who's hiring security testers right now? Yeah, most of the so that, that and that era hasn't ended. So, and now what else do we have? 2013, now again, we're talking about the history of security testing. Now we're in the present day. Now like automated, developer-centric, uh, running tests hundreds of times a day with every check-in, every build, is quickly becoming the norm in software development where now elaborate, multifaceted testing suites are part of every check-in. Now, and, and t now let's take a step back. I know we're still struggling in this area, but take a step back from hammer and nail building crypto cracking tools in, at, at w around World War II era to like Lint in the, in the, before the 80s doing like really early stage static analysis to Jira firing off 500 tests every time a developer touches a piece of code. We've come a long way. We've dramatically come a long way when it comes to security testing. Let's look at HTTPS now. Again, we've come a long way when it comes to application security. It all started in 94 with Netscape rolling out the first version of HTTPS. Moxie Marlinspike went and hunted down and found the engineer who built the original HTTPS stack. When he called him, this gentleman was retired. He was like, oh, HTTPS. I haven't thought about that in a long while. And Moxie's like, well, what about certificate authorities? And he was like, yeah, we realized we needed like someone to verify the public key in the browser. So we just kind of slapped that in in the end. I swear, this is, so it's like, this is the dawn of, of like real transport security over the web. Yeah, we just slapped the whole idea of the authority on in the end. I know some of you work for authorities. That's pretty much. I'm just. I'm gonna. I'm gonna be supportive. Let's not go there. Hi. How you doing there? <laughs> so, so that's how the authority system worked. So where are we going now? Now, 2009. Ivan Ristic. Anyone who studied or is into HTTPS in any way must have run into Ivan Ristic in some way. He wrote Bulletproof TLS. He's one of the premier thinkers in terms of HTTPS. Why I like Ivan is I like general principles that I can espound upon in front of an audience. He, he likes nitty bitty bit fiddling, figuring out stuff at the lowest possible level. He's, a, he's freaking insane in terms, I'm gonna figure this out. I'm gonna figure this out to understand how every single bit works in this protocol and he won't stop until he figures it out. So as part of that process, Ivan, 2009 he releases SSL Labs. 
this is this is a it's a commercial product but it's, it's free to the community and I'm not trying to I'm gonna mention some commercial things and not I'm not trying to endorse any company I'm trying to talk about history SSL labs changed the game when it came to HTTPS now every security pro can look at any public site anyone can look at any public site and with with good detail explain why it's configured good or bad who's used SSL labs in their work as a security professional everyone in the room it's awesome one of my favorite okay I, some, Richard, I, I'm not gonna, sometimes I behave in a little trollish manner. Sometimes. You're not going to believe this, but when SSL Labs came out, I loved this. I was like, oh, this is fun, because you could build a URL to any website on the net, and it will tweet, and, and, and you, it will, it, you click on it, it will give you the grade of that site. So I go to every single application security firm in the entire industry, and I tweet out their grade. And it wasn't that great. And I'm, this is, I'm not trying to like, I'm not trying to back up this behavior. We should be nice to each other. But I was in, I was like, I was having fun. I'm like, all right, this big security firm in application security, all right, F. This one, D. One of them was an X, one of them was Sigil. They're not around anymore. So I'm like, and th these are friends. I, I love these. These are great friends of mine. I worked with them for many years. But like, one of them was like, like giving me a hard time and leaning on me like you you don't understand the report you don't understand the real threat model you shouldn't be tweeting out these negative grades hurting our company then ivan jumps in and goes look everybody i know you, a lot of you are bashing manico for like tweeting out all your grades i have a suggestion leave him alone and go fix your freaking https server thank you ivan yes so all right so th th this is a fun and i'm a, i'm not the only one talking smack now Everyone's TLS HTTPS grade on their website is now public knowledge. And that changed a lot. That, at least right before my eyes, forced the whole AppSec industry to tighten up their TLS score, their HTTPS score. All right, let's keep going here. I'm sorry. I'm having, I'm having, a, little, having a little fun there. So 2010, Chrome starts. It's not quite HSTS. It's not quite strict transport security. But Chrome begins to preload some of their own properties. This is the dawn of modern strict transport security preloading with a browser in an a priori way knows if your website is bound to HTTPS or not. This is a really important part of modern HTTPS as a site owner. And so, and now 2010 as well, Fire Sheep comes out as a plugin for, for Firefox and OS X. Who here has fiddled with, with Fire Sheep when it came out in 2010? How many of you sat, okay, confessional time. Confession, security confession is a chance for redemption and healing. Who, who when Fire Sheep came out, who would like log in to like wireless networks at coffee shops and start clicking on people's profile and hijacking them. Who did that? Nobody raised their hand. You're lying. Okay, all right, who's lying and actually did it once to a friend of theirs? Yeah, there you go. Okay, all right. This was, but this, this made the ability to hijack anyone's, uh, anyone's Facebook, Twitter, I don't even know if it was right, uh, Yahoo email, Gmail, you can pop all of them with ease in a one-click interface. That, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, some of these websites were like, hmm, maybe we should implement HTTPS everywhere now. So this forced everyone's hand quickly to roll out HTTPS even after a user has initially logged in. It changed the world of HTTPS, I think, in a positive way. A little chaotic time, but... So now we have, at 2013, TLS 1.2 is now mainstream. TLS 1.2 came out in 2008. It took five years before it became mainstream. And I think that, that progress of adapting new standards has accelerated. Because it, by 2016, half the web is HTTPS. Chrome 51 at the, in, this, in 2016 defaults to HTTP2, which only allows TLS. Now, if you've looked at the HTTP2 standard, it doesn't require you use TLS. I think that's a bad choice, but that's what the standard body says. But the implementers, like Chrome and Firefox, they're forcing TLS for HTTP2. So the future of the web is a fully encrypted web as, we, as these new standards roll out over time. This is a good thing. And so what else? 2018, and look at what happened in just one year. Again, I'm trying to point out the acceleration of change in a positive way, how things are getting better, not in a linear fashion, but in an accelerating fashion. In 2018, Let's Encrypt starts offering free wildcard certs to the point where a lot of commercial authorities were piling on Let's Encrypt, not happy that they're entering their space 
as a free service. It's very controversial in the, in the commercial world. I think it's a great thing because it's really helped, you know, uh, Let's Encrypt starts in 2015, really helped accelerate the widespread usage of TLS where we hadn't seen it rolled out before. TLS 1.3 is published. It's already live in some browsers. And now certificate transparency required for all new certs. This is really progressive HTTPS changes. And where do we start? Oh yeah, authorities. Yeah, we kind of slapped on it at the end just for the heck of it. We had to get it in there somehow to now TLS 1.3 going from publication to rollout in under a year. And all these and, and, and modern certs are now available for free as our modern uh, progressive enhancements to HTTPS like certificate transparency. Awesome, big changes over the years. Let's look at passwords. This is a fun one. Uh, we could have easily broken this up over several slides. The history of passwords is so rich. So <clears throat> I'm trying to pull some of the interesting ones from it. So check this out. Where do we start? Where do we start when it came to passwords? Many of the, and I, I want to, there's a lot of different people who publish this list. I, I have a missing reference. This is from OpenWall, the password hashing group who really helped research a lot of this history. My apology to OpenWall for not citing you more clearly at the bottom here. A lot of this sequence came from them though. So it all started in 61. This is one of the first multi-user sharing systems, CTSS. It had a little bug. You know what an MOTD is, the message of the day? When you log in, you have this optional message of the day showing up to greet users who log in. Well, as part of the rotation of messages of the day, they accidentally slipped in the global password file for the entire system. So your message of the day every once in a while would be everybody else's password. OK, this is a, a very family-oriented kind of software. I don't know, but that's where we started and, and where we, when it comes to passwords. Let's jump down here. So now we're like in the, in the 70s. Crypt 3 is the main password verification algorithm in, in early versions of Unix up to the 6th edition. And it's using M old, uh, old M209 code. This is like hardware-based cryptography for, for, you, for uh, like NATO ally communications in World War II. So they ripped the algorithm out of this old clunker and made it the default for Linux. This is not, not the best of, of choices. So, so flash forward to 1994. And now Crypt3 is, Crypt is replaced by an MD5-based hashing algorithm doing a thousand iterations. It's, you know, it's, it's password stretching or key stretching. And we see reasonable size salts built in. This is good. This is the, the, the first time we're, we're seeing uh, various modern password storage cryptographic needs put into, into a default algorithm in a, in a major operating system. Now jump ahead to 1999. This is the biggest year when it comes to password storage, I think. This is when Bcrypt came out. And Bcrypt is best practice even today by many, uh, many AppSec educators and architects estimation. It's one of the reasonable choices for password storage. So 99 is when that came out. Usenix talk, um, you're using 128-bit salts. We tend to recommend do your own salting on top of Bcrypt, but this is a real example of modern password storage still viable 20 years later. That's impressive. Now let's jump ahead to 2007. Now this is a big deal because now PHP defaults their password storage algorithm, defaults to Bcrypt where it's available. So now a, a reasonable choice for password storage becomes main, mainstream in the most popular language that drives the web. And now Bcrypt usage becomes widespread. This is great. And this is important because uh, it, it's forcing developers to use best practices for password storage in their database. You know, we've seen a lot of password breaches even in recent years. Using a proper algorithm limits the impact of those kind of breaches. Now, 2016, Dr. Dev. So this, this guy right here with the yellow shirt, he writes an article in 2016 that des describes how Dropbox publishes their password storage. And they publish that strategy. He describes you know, doing salting and, and uh, salting, take the salt and the password and hash that 
to minimize problems like too long passwords or get truncated by bcrypt at 72 bytes, problems like uh, we, want to, we want to pre hash to stop things like denial of service problems against long passwords. Uh, he talks about the use of bcrypt and he talks about the use of peppering. This is putting a lot of these modern password storage concepts together in an article for the first time. Many of my peers who are, who are educators, they cite this as best practice. So it's just neat that you're here. Like living history, stand before us. No, I'm embarrassing you. He already got me. Say, just wave, just wave. Do you, do you agree that in 2016, you agree it's best practice today or close to it? Yes. I, may, I may swap out with Argon or Scrypt, maybe. Right? If you're going to use Scrypt, make sure you use more than a mega as your RAM consumption. But anyways, this is still best practice today. So I asked him, do you think this is best practice today? He was like, yeah, of course. So no, no, no you deserve that. Um, <laughs> This helped this help so many of us take, no seriously, this, this helped so many of us take an idea that was so debated in such, like, in such prolific ways we would fight about this, we could finally end the debate and start implementing it properly. So it's, I think it's a big deal what you did there. So look at, so let's go to OWASP project history now. Again, back to 2001, WebGoat changed the world of testing in a big way, gave us all something to, to beat up and, and hone skills, and a common attack surface we can talk about to hone our skills as well. It's not just the hacking platform, it's the vulnerabilities that we all know about, that we had, that had gone through many times and can use to discuss these issues as well. So, so that's WebGoat and the OWASP attack component, really early projects. 2006, OWASP reform comes out. This is around this era, cross, we'll look at cross-site scripting history in just a moment. 2006 in this era, cross-site scripting is still very new. And from a defensive point of view, we're in the stone age in 2006. We, really do, we give really bad advice, validation, whatever, how to fix this. But then we have the OWASP reform project come out. It's an escaping library for every major language in that era. And now we have a real world tool to start doing XSS defense properly. And a lot of other things came from this. Uh, we, we have the OWASP Java encoder, the XSS prevention cheat sheet, the DOM XSS prevention cheat sheet, a lot of the modern XSS defense theory that came out of OWASP, it all came from the reform project and the original production quality escaping library, which is a necessary control to stop cross-site scripting. <coughs> 2008 ASVS comes out. This is the first real application security standard that's detailed and technical and, and meaningful, I think. And so this is where we're really starting to solidify knowledge around security. Jeff Williams, Dave Wickers, Mike Baberski, and a few others were the team that really came out with this. And really, really important work in the industry. The ASVS 4 is about to come out in 2019 as well. So that work continues to this day. 2009, the OWASP Top 10 comes out the most ill-cited document of all time. It's not, a, it's not a standard PCI, please. All right, sorry, sorry. So OWASP top 10 comes out, the most debated, uh, controversial, popular OWASP document of all time. I mean, we, it's, it, it's changed, all of us have read it. It's part of the discourse of application security. And, and I think it's fascinating, the, the, this, this project and how it's migrated over time. 2017, 2018, there's a new team running it. Data Scientist is a part of that team. And it's still a very important document. All right, where else? So, oh yeah, Open SAM starts around this era. This is like software assurance maturity model looking at process from a professional software construction point of view. A lot of great work came out of SAM. I think SAM is interesting because it wasn't worked on for a decade and I was grabbing like, a, like an eight year old version of, of SAM and it was very, still very valuable years later. That's a good sign. Mobile project in 2010, Zap shows up. Now like a production quality web application scanning tool shows up that really in some ways is better than tools at this era that were $100,000. I saw some head-to-heads around this era, uh, like 2010, 2011, where Zap Scanner was being tested head-to-head -head against a commercial product that had like a $100,000 license attached to it. Zap did not win that competition, but it did really good. It found most, and so Zap pushed Burp 
and a lot of other vendors into upping their game, as well as gave the whole security community a tool to do web testing in a very rigorous way. So Zap changed the world. Is Simon even here? Simon Bennett, please. So, Simon Bennett, yeah, Simon, I, I agree. Simon, Simon Bennett, he, he's done a lot of work, great work. This, around this time, the OWASP Mod Security Core, core Rule Set moves over to OWASP. This is one of the first big WASC, W-A-S-C projects that's getting sucked into OWASP. So it's an interesting thing. Ryan Barnett and others help with this migration. Um, what else? What, Juice Shop around 2014. This is a mean stack web API version of WebGoat. Dependency check shows up. This, I can't even tell you the story behind this. It's a little interesting, but this is Jeremy Long, who was not happy with the vendor space for third-party management in this era, and he got taunted by one of them, well, go build it yourself. So he was like, I'm going to go build it myself. So Jeremy like, would wake up at like 5 in the morning before his family woke up and spend a couple hours every morning building his own dependency checks. This is a tool that scans an app and reports on third-party vulnerabilities in third-party libraries. And this is now has a full team. It's very mature. It's one of our flagship projects. He still works on it with Steven Springlet and many other developers to this day. And it has really pushed a whole industry of those doing third party security analysis, which is a big industry now. He set the baseline. You better do as good as my free tool if you're going to sell a commercial tool. So again, pushing the industry to do better with open source. Very proud of Jeremy for his work. IoT Top 10 comes out in 2018, Daniel Meisler. And by and OWASH Cheat Sheet started, where is that? OWASH Cheat Sheet. The first one started around 2009, the XSS Prevention Cheat Sheet. Jeff Williams, wherever you are, Jeff. And this is by far the most heavily hit page of the entire history of the OWASP wiki, even more than the OWASP top 10 pages, I believe, I dare say. And that started in 2009. I helped run the project for a while, and it's not just me, like with like hundreds of authors, we now have 50 production release cheat sheets to help developers write secure code. Very proud to see these projects and other people working on it and donating their expertise to get us to where we are today. Dominique Regretto from uh, Luxembourg is, is a co-project leader and has enhanced it in every way possible. So this is, look, look at where we've come. You know, look at what we've built as a community and look at how how much the world points to OWASP projects and documentation for all of our imperfection, they still point to us for guidance and for, to help other people learn about this stuff. And, you know, I, I heard someone recently uh, uh, go, uh, like kind of making fun of OWASP. They're like, oh, in OWASP infinite wisdom, you're supposed to do this, kind of rolling his eyes at us. And I both went, come on, grow up. But I was also, it also made me smile. I'm like, people, for, for better and for worse, People point to us for advice as a community, and it's a big responsibility. I think we're overall doing a good job holding up that responsibility. We're volunteers. We don't get paid to do this stuff. We're doing the best we can under difficult circumstances, tough technology. I think we're doing a good job as a community, like holding up the virtues of open source and helping people when it comes to application security. How am I doing on time? Let's do a quick time check. How am I doing? Fine. Fine? Let's talk about XSS. I love this topic. It's a fun topic. Uh, there, there's, I, I know a lot, a lot of the researchers in this area are good friends of mine, and it's, it's, I, I enjoy the subject and debate a lot. And it's something that's unsolved. It's insane how unsolved this is and how difficult of a problem it is. But 99, the Microsoft engineering team coins the term cross-site scripting for the first time. This is a bad name. Sorry, we should have called it. What should we have called it? St go back in time. Hey, Paul, what's that? HTML injection. I, I, think, I think that's a, I think I like the injection, content injection, but HTML is not enough. What do you think, Pedro? JavaScript injection. And, and, that, and that's not enough because we lose the markup injection. So, yeah. client, so side client side code injection, content injection, JavaScript and HTML and VB script, if you're really crazy, and something else injection, <laughs> right? But I like, I like content injection. But, but what, what's, the, what's the real name? Say it, Brian. Cross-site scripting. That's still, that's still the name that we use, whatever. So, you know, what did Shakespeare say about names? Do you know, do you know that? A rose by any name would still be just as sweet, good sir, right? Whatever. <laughs> so I, I think it's a really bad quoting of Shakespeare. But... All right. <laughs> He's like, I'm... hello, Brian. Okay. 
So 99 cross-site scripting is termed for the first time we see the first generation attacks. 2002 HTTP only gets rolled out in IE6 service pack one. This is to stop cookies from being read in JavaScript. Still a best practice to this day. So 2005, but most of all, Sammy's my hero. What's this? <laughs> Sammy worm against MySpace, right? It's not even that complex code. It's a little bit of code that, that is cross-site scripting vulnerability in one of the profile areas that forces you to add Sammy as a friend. And this attack ended up blue screening, this .NET architecture at the time, blue screened the entire MySpace global infrastructure as too many people were adding Sammy as a friend in a worm-like way. You add Sammy as a friend, so just looking at Sammy's profile, he's your friend on your friend list, and anyone looking at your friend list, Sammy bopped to that user profile as well. So within like, like a day, millions of users were adding Sammy as a friend, and again, it blue screened the entire global uh, MySpace infrastructure, right? Sammy was like, and then let's flash forward a year, Sammy's in an orange, orange jumpsuit, Right, cleaning up the streets of LA. Yeah, he paid, he paid, he paid for his crime and he's doing great in his life now. Sammy is my hero. Um, not because of that, because of how great of a researcher he is. <laughs> but to those of us in the industry, I, I remember talking to some other people who are consult, consulting leads at this time. They were like, so terrible what Sammy did. And I want to hug him so much, it's business! Because it, it brought huge awareness to web security. There's a big uptick in web security business in this era. So I just remember a lot of people going, Sammy, how, you shouldn't have done that to MySpace. Good job, do more. So anyways, this is interesting. Uh, let's just move on, let's just move on, folks. 2011, we have Dr. Jeff Ikonowski releasing the OWASP Java Encoder. This is a, this is just, this is a, what I feel is next generation escaping library with like 12 different contexts. It's extremely performance friendly. It's controversial. He's co encoding the bare minimum necessary to provide security. A lot of people said, you're doing it wrong. Your, your, the, the guidance says you should encode more characters. And he's like, well, show me and I'll fix it. And no one ever has. So, but he still gets beat up for his, but this is, this is, I'm like, Jeff, how did you know what to do? He's like, well, I decoded all the browsers, looked at their source code rendering and made my decisions based on that research. I'm like, yes, sir. So <laughs> yeah, you go, Jeff. So really next generation escaping library. Other things we see in this era and beyond are things like Go template auto escaping, React and Angular auto escaping, sanitizers built into frameworks. This is the dawn for me of the modern XSS defense era. Around the same time, Michael Samuel from Google releases the OWASH Java HTML sanitizer. You escape strings, you sanitize fragments of HTML, and he still maintains it to this day. And so this is an example of, and Java, most popular language out there, was missing these, these core artifacts and security. They're now extremely popular in the Java ecosystem. So, and now 2014, CSP 2.0 comes out. Why is C CSP 2.0 so important in the history of XSS defense? Who wants to go there? CSP 2.0 had a little something in it that really made content security policy deployable for the first time. What is that? Who said that? Give me some high five. That's the right. So we see nonces show up for the first time in CSP2. My friends at Twitter said when CSP1 was out, years of messing with it, we're not live yet. Nonces come out, we're three days later pushed live on some of Twitter property. So this is where CSP is really viable. And around the same time, this little researcher known as Mario Heinrich, am I pronouncing his name right? Yeah. Right? So Mario, he's one of the, the top dogs in this, in the specific area of how do, I, how do I attack an app that sanitizing HTML fragments, I can break that. See, that's his weird little specialty, and he is good at it. Did a lot of shows for some of us in the industry of how he's popping HTML sanitizers. Again, he's really gifted at this. So he started, so this is where he first publishes Dom Purify. This is such an important tool in JavaScript defense and XSS defense. It sanitizes HTML in native JavaScript. They're gonna add Dom Purify like feature native to the next version of JavaScript or markup. So this is historical because we finally have a real way to sanitize fragments of HTML with the JavaScript library, and we can use this to go back to lots of old mistakes and fix them fast. 
And so this is now a like very mature library analyzed by lots of security folks. In 2015, we have CSP 3.0. Now we're, this is around this era, Michael Spagnolo and Lucas Weichelbaum give a talk at AppSec EU in 2016 in Europe showing a very quick and easy way to roll out CSP. Anyone know what feature of CSP3 made it so much easier to roll out progressive policies with, without maintaining whitelists anymore so you can just roll this stuff out fast? What do you got, Pedro? You're going to go for two. Are you going to trade in the car you won for door number two? What you got? Strict dynamic, yes, that's the right answer. CSP, give, 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 give him a little XSS, yeah, yeah, exactly. No, good answer. Strict dynamic, see, I know it because I wrote the slides. You know, it's strict, strict dynamic shows up, which lets, which lets us build uh, non-whitelist progressive policies. And these gentlemen around this 2016, AppSec EU, Spagnolo and Weichelbaum, they show it, they put this together with a few other tricks to show us how to like, push out a policy right away. I was teaching their content at a class with their permission, of course, and this is a company had been struggling with the whitelist for years. So in the middle of class, I'm showing them this technique and they were like, it works. And they, being in a class, they pushed it out to their dev server. And like 45 minutes later, they got a report back. Someone, someone had looked at it who, and said, passed our test. So I pushed it live in the middle of the class. The whitelist guy working on CSP 1.0 whitelist was not happy with us. But the technique that we see in this era, now, now I have DOM Purify to remediate old code. Now I have modern escaping and auto escaping frameworks. I have good knowledge in this area. I have CSP3 standards. Look at how far we've come here. From Microsoft coining the term cross-site scripting as a big fat misnomer to these great modern technologies to really fight this problem if you want to within code. So a few more dates, like the first DEF CON, PCI DSS in 2004, OWASP Mobile is only nine years old, IoT uh, shows up at OWASP in 2014, and these technologies we depend on now, Docker and Kubernetes, uh, NIST 863-3, the digital media authentication guidelines from NIST change the world of passwords and what we think about password policy. And AppSec is now global today. Let me wind up here. Now AppSec is, is woven into all of IT. It's woven into all of development. It's woven into all of security. I was talking to a, a manufacturer in the world of like, uh, the world of like building software for municipalities, running 911 systems, running infrastructure for the world now. And they're like, the most common feature that my customers ask for by a wide margin is security. That's, where, that's what's happened. That's what a lot of us are a part of now in some way. And, that, and OWASP and AppSec is everywhere, for better and for worse sometimes, but more better than worse in my opinion. And so what else do we, what else do we have here? And so what is OWASP doing today? We're now doing outreach. To, I think of the early days of OWASP where Curfee is building a website and having discussions with a pile of researchers and web goats getting started to OWASP being so big that we're pushing, we have people going out to other conferences to do outreach for application security. This is fantastic. This is the work of John McCoy here and others who are helping push, and everyone in the community pushing the name of OWASP everywhere. To like to now like we gave out 35 scholarships from other organizations to pay for women to join us in the world of application security, uh, and these are this is only good intention, right? Let's finish with this though. Let's finish with a, one last bit. Let's finish with the future of AppSec. This is total conspiracy theory stuff. So. So before you yell at me, just breathe. We're, at, we're now going into this, oh, I love him. He's awesome, right? Ancient aliens are stealing time. We're going into that era. So here we go. All identities become tied to blockchain-like security architectures. Yeah, I hate blockchain, John. Just so you know, he, John made me put this in here. All right, all right, all right. <clears throat> Smart contracts control most real-world infrastructure. Who's with me? Okay, I'm just gonna move on here, right? <laughs> AppSec critical task augmented by artificial intelligence. Tony UV elected president makes everyone do threat modeling. Is Tony even here? <laughs> Tony, is, is you, he's not even in the room. All right, whatever you are, Tony. Yes, I love threat modeling. Secure architecture and design become common and mandatory in software development. I see that already to some degree in some shops. 
distributed CA models completely deprecate the existing centralized CA model. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Automatic, okay, data-centric access control native at the data level itself in all major databases. What else? HBS is going to reach 100% of the internet. Automatic data sanitization is escaping native everywhere. Extremely secure frameworks. Personal HSMs for, become the norm. Cloud-native serverless security functionality drives most software. Maybe. We'll see. We'll be there. I'll be there. I hope you are, too. You know, and before I finish up, Amy A. And ask me anything. Does anybody have any questions about anything we talked about? Any apps that questions in general before I wrap up? Go for it. Yes, ma'am. Yes, when are you publishing that book? <laughs> which, which book? That one. Um, I'll publish the slides. How's that? I, I'll, publi I'll publish the slides. So I really want to say thank you to John McCoy, and, and Zoe Braderman, they helped me like research these dates, build the structure for this talk, and just lend support. I'm a little nervous doing a keynote, but I'm, I'm, I'm really grateful for their work. Thank you, Zoe. Thank you, John. <laughs> Keep coming. Thank you to the AppSec California team as well. You know, the, the amount of man and woman hours that goes into making this conference blows the mind. These are folks who've been running this conference for many years. They're very passionate about it. They volunteer a lot of their time and energy. And this is better than a lot of the commercial conferences I see. So this is my favorite conference by far that I look forward to being at every year. Thank you again to the team that makes this happen. LA, Orange County, Santa Barbara, San Diego, Bay Area, even Inland Empire. One more round of applause for making this happen. All right. And coming up, right, we have Tel Aviv coming up. The D Washington, D.C. will be AppSec USA in October. The date's not set. Here's some other events coming up in the world of OWASP. And most importantly, thank you to you. you know, the people in this room make up a big chunk of the application security industry. I know the work you're doing is hard. I know it's a grind. I know it's an uphill battle a lot of the time. And I know that the, the drain it puts on many of my friends and coworkers is extreme. This is stressful. It's not fun to be a salmon all the time, swimming upstream, trying to encourage people to do security testing, to think about process, to write secure code, to take this seriously. But we do it, we keep going, and I want to re thank you for helping the world be more secure. And take a, t take a moment to look, to take a step back to look at everything that's happened in the last 20, 30 years. Remember how far we've come and remember that you're a part of this. So thank you to you for being here and caring about this topic. All right?